The girl came home from school and was left alone for just a few minutes. However, when her parents returned, she was already gone. The police and volunteers searched for her for several weeks, but it was as if she had vanished into thin air. Then, unexpectedly, there was a surprising turn of events that led to a chain of consequences, ultimately shocking the entire country. This case became one of the most notorious and scandalous in Canadian history, and it remains so to this day. Christine Jessup was born on November 29, 1974, in the small Canadian town of Queensville. It was a quiet and peaceful place near a picturesque lake, with a population of only about 600 people. Queensville was considered a very safe community where many residents knew each other. Christine lived there with her parents and older brother who was five years her senior. She loved spending time outdoors, riding her bike and playing baseball, a passion she developed thanks to her brother. Christine also had a deep love for animals. Once, when a bat flew into her room, unlike her family, she wasn't afraid and even wanted to keep it as a pet. On October 3, 1984, when Christine was nine years old, she woke up early in the morning as usual and started getting ready for school. Her brother had a toothache, so their mother was preparing to take him to the dentist. After school, Christine was supposed to stay home alone until they returned. Although she was young, this wasn't the first time Christine had been left unattended, and her parents weren't worried, knowing she was independent and capable of taking care of herself. Before leaving for school, Christine arranged to meet her best friend after they both got home. She boarded the school bus, which dropped her off a few hundred meters from her house. At the agreed time, Christine's friend arrived at the park where they had planned to meet and waited for her. However, Christine never showed up. After waiting for a while, the friend returned home and tried calling Christine, but there was no answer. Meanwhile, Christine's mother and brother returned home and immediately noticed that Christine was missing. It was clear she had been home after school, her backpack was in her room, and letters from the mailbox were in the corridor. However, a few strange details caught her mother's attention. First, Christine's bicycle was lying in front of the house with its kickstand bent. Christine loved that bike, so it was unusual for her to leave it outside like that. Second, her jacket was hung on a high hook in the hallway, which Christine couldn't have reached on her own. Initially, Christine's mother didn't think there was any cause for concern. She assumed Christine had just gone for a walk as she often did and would be home soon. But as it grew darker, and Christine still hadn't returned, her mother began to worry. She started calling the parents of Christine's friends hoping that Christine was with one of them. However, no one had seen her since school. When Christine's mother contacted her best friend she learned they had planned to meet in the park, but Christine never arrived. Realizing no one had seen her daughter, Christine's mother and her friend began searching the small town, quickly covering all the places Christine liked to visit, but she was nowhere to be found, and by 7 p.m., her mother decided to contact the police. The local police department was accustomed to handling cases like this, which often involved children who had either wandered off or temporarily left home out of frustration. In most instances, these children were quickly found without the need for a lengthy investigation. This time, the police organized a search, asking for help from the townspeople, who responded immediately. In addition, the police discovered that Christine had visited a small store located between her house and the park where she was supposed to meet her friend. She had bought some bubble gum, but where she went afterward remained a mystery. There were no security cameras in those days, so the police couldn't even establish an exact timeline. They believed Christine visited the store just minutes after arriving home from school. The search continued through the night, but they were unable to find Christine. The next day, more people joined the search and the police began receiving various tips. However, none of them led to any breakthroughs. Most of the reports were from people who thought they had seen a girl on the street or in a passing car, but no one was sure if it was Christine. In the following days, the police began to doubt that they were dealing with a kidnapping. It seemed almost impossible that Christina could have gone unnoticed, especially when every resident in town was aware of her disappearance. Christina's mother also insisted that her daughter would never have run away from home. 
Despite these considerations, the police were still unable to uncover any clues that might lead them closer to finding the girl. They conducted a search of her home, but due to a lack of experience, the investigation was handled poorly. The police conducted a superficial examination of some of Christina's belongings without collecting fingerprints. Additionally, they admitted that before the house was examined, dozens of Christine's neighbors and family friends had been there, which compromised any potential evidence. At the time of Christine's disappearance, her father was in prison, serving a short sentence for petty fraud. On the day Christine vanished, her mother and brother had visited him after a trip to the dentist. Once it became clear that Christine had likely been abducted, her father was released from prison to be with his family. He immediately joined the search for his daughter. The search efforts lasted for several weeks but they were unable to find Christine or uncover any evidence that could shed light on her disappearance. The search area gradually expanded to include fields and forests surrounding the town, but no results were found. This continued for three months until December 31st. While everyone else was preparing to celebrate the new year, Christine's family had no time for holiday festivities. They clung to the hope that Christine might still be found alive, though deep down, they had almost given up believing it was possible. On that day, a man from the nearby town of Sunderland, located about five kilometers away, was out walking his dog in a deserted wooded area behind his home. He noticed what looked like a small pile of garbage and, out of curiosity, approached it. To his horror, he discovered a human body and immediately rushed home to call the police. When the officers arrived at the scene, they quickly identified the deceased despite the severe decomposition. Lying next to the body was a small tape recorder with a piece of paper bearing the name Christine Jessup taped to it. This tape recorder had been given to Christine at school on the day she disappeared. The officers immediately suspected that the victim had been assaulted as some of her clothing, including her pants and underwear, were found lying next to the body. The upper portion of her clothing was still on her body. The medical examiners later confirmed that Christine had suffered multiple stab wounds which caused her death and she had also been sexually assaulted. A third-party biological material was found on her underwear but DNA analysis was not yet available at the time, so this evidence couldn't help identify the perpetrator. Investigators believed that Christine had been killed elsewhere and then transported to the location where her body was found. However, they were puzzled as to why the killer would drive nearly 60 kilometers and leave the body near another town, especially when there were plenty of fields and forests closer to Queensville. They theorized that the perpetrator might have had some connection to Sunderland and chose that location because he was familiar with it. At the same time, they were fairly certain that the killer lived in Queensville and knew Christine. As all indications suggested she may have gone with him or gotten into his car willingly. The investigators repeatedly asked Christine's parents if they could think of anyone who might be a possible suspect. Her mother insisted over and over again that she couldn't think of anyone who seemed suspicious. The police interviewed nearly every resident in the town and considered several individuals with criminal histories or those mentioned in various tips, but they couldn't establish any connections to the crime. This continued until February 14th, when detectives returned to speak with Christine's mother once again. They asked her if she had thought of anyone who might seem suspicious, and this time, she recalled something odd. The SOV family lived in the neighborhood and was well-respected in the town. The head of the family owned a small business and was known for his ability to fix almost anything, so many residents frequently sought his help. He was well-regarded, and he had six adult children who assisted him in the business. One of them was 20-year-old Paul, who lived with his parents. Christine's mother remembered a few strange things about Paul. First, after Christine disappeared, Paul never participated in the search efforts even though nearly every resident in town had joined in. Secondly, after Christine's body was found, Paul did not attend her funeral, which was attended by hundreds of people. Christine's mother also mentioned that Paul was a quiet, introverted individual who had few friends and generally kept to himself. He was also known to play the clarinet, which struck the detectives as interesting because Christine had her tape recorder with her at the time of the abduction. They speculated that Paul might have used music to lure Christine and get her to talk.
Additionally, Christine likely knew Paul since he had lived just a few meters from her house for his entire life. The detectives decided to visit Paul at his home and asked him how well he knew Christine. Paul claimed they had barely interacted, except for one occasion when Christine's dog had run away and he helped her catch it. When asked where he was on the day of Christine's disappearance, Paul stated that he had been at work, 57 kilometers away from the town, until about 3.30 p.m. Afterward, he said he went to a grocery store, stopped at a gas station, and returned home around 5 p.m. The detectives then asked him what he thought about Christine, to which he responded that she was just a regular sweetheart but then added a strange comment saying, but sometimes they grow up to be spoiled. This odd remark raised suspicions among the investigators, prompting them to verify his alibi. The detectives obtained records from the factory where Paul worked which confirmed that he had finished his shift at exactly 3.32 p.m. This meant that even if he had gone directly to Christine's house, he wouldn't have had enough time to arrive before her mother returned home. Further checks confirmed that Paul had indeed stopped at a store and a gas station, which took about half an hour in total. Paul's relatives also confirmed that he arrived home around 5 p.m. and went to bed shortly afterward because he was tired from work. Based on this information, there didn't seem to be enough time for Paul to have abducted Christine. However, investigators suspected that Paul's relatives might have either been mistaken about the time or were deliberately covering for him. The detectives requested permission to inspect the car Paul had driven. In the trunk, they found several fabric fibers, which were sent for analysis. The experts determined that these fibers matched the fabric of the sweater Christine was wearing on the day she disappeared. Additionally, several hairs were found on Christine's body, and experts suggested they could belong to Paul. However, DNA testing was not yet available so the specialist could only visually compare the hair samples and conclude that they were similar, without being able to confirm a definitive match. Finally, the police consulted a criminal profiler who analyzed the case. According to the profiler, the perpetrator was likely a male from Queensville, aged 19 to 26, with a criminal history involving crimes such as arson or voyeurism. The profiler provided other characteristics, but the detectives focused only on those that didn't match Paul, who had no criminal record or bad reputation. Despite fitting fewer than half of the profiler's criteria, the police remained convinced that Paul was the killer. On April 22, the police decided to arrest Paul. He denied any involvement in the crime, but was placed in prison to await trial. Christine's parents were shocked that their nearest neighbor could be involved, but the detective's main challenge was reconciling the timeline given by Christine's mother, who was certain she had arrived home at 4.10 p.m. She was sure of this because she had looked at the clock as soon as she entered the kitchen. According to the investigators, Paul couldn't have reached Christine's house from work before 4.10 p.m., as he would have needed at least 15 to 20 minutes. They continued to press Christine's mother asking if she was absolutely certain about the time or if she could have been mistaken. Eventually, Christine's mother admitted that she might have arrived a little later than she initially thought. This admission was enough for the police to proceed with the case. During the trial, the prosecution tried to portray Paul as a strange loner whose behavior made others in the town uneasy. They also argued that Paul could have had enough time to kidnap Christine because her mother had likely arrived home later than she had originally stated. As for the testimony of Paul's relatives, who confirmed his alibi, a psychologist brought in by the prosecution claimed that the family showed signs of covering for Paul. One of the key points in the trial was the testimony of an undercover police officer who had been placed in Paul's cell while he awaited trial. The officer claimed that Paul mentioned specific details about the crime, such as the cause of the victim's death. However, these details had been widely reported in the media, so Paul wasn't revealing anything new. Additionally, Paul had told the cellmate that he was not guilty and frequently quoted lines from his favorite movie. The undercover officer's testimony had a significant impact on the trial bolstering the prosecution's attempts to paint Paul as a dangerous and strange individual. Despite this, the primary evidence against Paul remained questionable. 
In the end the jury found the evidence insufficient to convict, and Paul was found not guilty. He was released from the courtroom, but the prosecution immediately announced plans to appeal, and Christine's family remained convinced of his involvement. I was shocked to once again find myself living just a few meters away from the man accused of murdering our daughter. The girl's father added that at the time of her death, they were living in a nightmare, and now that nightmare would continue. The residents of Queensville were also dissatisfied with the court's decision. They were holding out hope for an appeal because, during the first trial, the judge failed to provide the jury with a clear explanation of the concept of beyond a reasonable doubt. This omission was enough for the higher court to order a new trial, which began in 1991, several years after the murder. In preparation for the retrial, several interesting facts emerged. It was discovered that the expert who had originally determined a match between the fibers found in Paul's car and the victim's sweater had conducted the analysis using a sweater of the same color and material, not the actual evidence. By the time of the second trial, most of the materials related to this analysis, including fabric samples and several hairs found on the victim's body, had mysteriously disappeared. Additionally, some of Christine's bones and a cigarette butt found near her body were missing, possibly never having been included in the case file at all. Despite these irregularities, the prosecution pressed on with the new trial. This time, the prosecution's main theory was that Paul had seen Christine with a tape recorder in her hands, taken out his musical instrument and started playing. The girl, drawn by the music, was lured into Paul's car, where he then abducted and killed her. Although this version of events was weak, the jury in July 1992 unanimously found Paul guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison. However, after the second trial, public opinion began to shift. Initially, the media had portrayed Paul as strange and dangerous. But as more information emerged about the investigators' mishandling of the case, the narrative changed. The media began to speculate that Paul might be innocent a victim of police incompetence. Amidst this, a group of concerned citizens banded together to challenge the court's decision. Under pressure, Paul's lawyer filed an appeal, and Paul was released from prison pending its outcome, a rare occurrence, but one that was possible due to the widespread public outcry. There were challenges, however, as the bail was set at around half a million dollars, forcing Paul's parents to mortgage their home to raise the money. Paul's lawyer requested a DNA test on the biological material found on the victim's underwear, which had been inconclusive when first tested due to the primitive techniques available at the time. By the mid-1990s, advances in DNA technology allowed experts to obtain a clear DNA profile from the semen found on the fabric. The results definitively showed that the DNA did not match Paul's. This revelation caused a public outcry in Canada. Paul had spent a total of a year and a half behind bars and several more years entangled in court proceedings, his life effectively ruined. This wrongful conviction was directly caused by the actions of the police, who had failed to find concrete evidence and instead manipulated the available evidence to implicate Paul. In January 1995, exactly 10 years after Christine's body was discovered, all charges against Paul were finally dropped and he was declared a free man. Later, Paul sued the authorities for $1.2 million, and some of the investigators who had fabricated evidence against him were named as defendants in the case. This case became one of the most significant in Canadian legal history, prompting major changes to the justice system to prevent such miscarriages of justice from happening again. After Paul's release, it was decided to reopen the investigation into Christine's murder. A new team of detectives was assembled, and with the DNA profile of the real perpetrator now in hand, they focused on collecting genetic samples from anyone who could theoretically have committed the crime. In total, they tested the DNA of several hundred men, but none matched the DNA from the crime scene. Despite these efforts, progress stalled, and the case was eventually handed over to the Unsolved Homicide Department, where it was periodically reviewed over the following years. One of the main issues was that the original investigative team had not only lost crucial evidence, but had also failed to conduct a proper investigation. 
They had been so certain of Paul's guilt that they hadn't even considered other suspects. The Canadian media continued to follow the case, and after a major publication, journalists received a number of interesting tips. At least three new suspects were identified. One person claimed that their father had confessed to killing Christine before his death, while others pointed to individuals with problematic reputations who had lived in Queensville at the time. This information was passed on to the authorities. In 2019, 35 years after Christine's murder, the case was reopened once again, with renewed efforts to finally solve the crime. A new detective, realizing that the only solid lead in the case was a DNA sample from the perpetrator, decided to try using genetic genealogy to track down the killer. However, there were no companies in Canada capable of handling this complex and innovative process, so the detective had to negotiate with U.S.-based companies and secure the necessary funding. Eventually, he received approval, and the experts began searching public DNA databases for relatives of the criminal. They managed to identify several distant relatives, but tracing their ancestry could take years. The experts provided information about these distant relatives, which helped narrow down the search. Ultimately, they concluded that the police needed to investigate the family trees of about 400 individuals to find the person matching the DNA sample. Armed with this information, the detective reached out to a Canadian colleague with extensive experience in DNA work, who agreed to assist with the investigation. Together they began reconstructing the genealogies of these individuals. The detective decided not to share any information with his colleague to avoid bias and prevent himself from forming any premature theories about potential suspects. The specialist methodically examined the family trees until they eventually traced an ancestor back to a man born in 1804. From there they meticulously studied hundreds of descendants. By October 2020, they had focused on a particular family and zeroed in on a single individual who fit all the criteria for the most likely suspect. The detective didn't recognize the name. This man had never appeared in the case files or among the thousands of leads generated over the decades. As the detective began investigating further, he was shocked by an unexpected discovery. The man was one of Christine's family's closest friends. At the time of the murder, he was 28 years old, living in Queensville with his wife and children. Christine's parents had been friends with this man for years, often relying on each other in times of need. Just a few days before the incident, Christine's mother had visited the man's wife and mentioned that she was planning to visit her husband in prison with their son after a dentist appointment. She noted that she wouldn't be taking Christine along because she was too young for such a visit. The wife knew Christine would be alone at home at a specific time on that particular day, and it turned out that the man himself was also at home and could have overheard this conversation. Christine, being familiar with him, would likely have followed him or gotten into his car without suspicion. The detective then questioned why this man's name had never appeared in the case files, given his close relationship with the family. He uncovered another interesting fact. Back then, the police had spoken to the man's wife, who said that she wasn't home at the time of Christine's disappearance, but that her husband was at home looking after their young children. This was apparently enough for the police who took her word as an alibi and didn't bother to interview the man himself. It became clear that the man had the opportunity to commit the crime. All that remained for the detective was to confirm his guilt. But there was a problem. The suspect had passed away in 2015, having requested death due to serious health problems. The detective needed a direct DNA sample from the deceased, but cases like this weren't always investigated, and even if the body had been examined, there might not be any biological samples left after five years. However, the detective caught a lucky break when he contacted the medical experts who had examined the body, they confirmed that they still had two test tubes of the man's blood in storage. The samples were sent to the lab, and when experts extracted and compared the DNA to the killer's profile, it was a perfect match. The man was indeed Christine's murderer. Christine's parents were devastated by the news, 
they could never have imagined that their close friend was the killer. They were also angered that he had lived out his life with his family and children, escaping justice for his crime. His relatives were equally shocked when the police informed them of what had happened. The man's wife said she never suspected her husband was involved in Christine's disappearance. Paul, the man wrongly accused of the crime, told journalists that the discovery of the real killer didn't change much for him. He had spent nearly 10 years between prison and court, and even after being exonerated, many people continued to view him as a murderer. He added that he lived in constant fear, a fear that persists to this day. He concluded by saying that this case not only ruined Christine's life but also his own. Feel free to share your thoughts on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like the video if you found it interesting. Thanks for sticking with us through this gripping case. If you found this story as compelling as we did, please hit the like button and share your thoughts in the comments. We always appreciate hearing your perspectives. Until next time, stay safe, stay curious, and keep asking questions.